Companies were always claiming to have made the world's smallest radio. There were these tiny novelty radios that made the claim, but they didn't have speakers in them and could only be heard through earphones. So to the major radio makers, and most of the public, these weren't real radios. But a couple of years before the transistor radio appeared in late 1954, some of the major radio makers began a race to be first to make a real radio with a built-in speaker that could truly be called the world's smallest. Today, we're looking at the radio that won that race. Emerson that's who was first to market with the smallest full-featured radio with a speaker in the pre-transistor era. What made this race to miniaturization even possible was the recent development of miniature vacuum tubes, what were called sub-miniature tubes. Most of these tiny tubes were flat, like the ones you see here, and were very tightly packed inside the devices in which they were used, which was mostly hearing aids, and beginning with this Emerson Model 747 radios. But this Emerson radio was ahead of its time in more ways than one. Its lavish use of underpainted plastic all over its front was greatly influential in the designs of transistor radios to come in the following years, especially radios made in Japan. Japanese designers took the art of underpainted plastic in product design soaring to new heights by the late 1950s. Not so much the American makers. There was limited use of the technique by them, it is not a coincidence that it was Emerson, among the American radio makers, who continued using the technique most in the transistor era. You get inside this radio through the front, but how do you get this very beautiful but very delicate looking piece of plastic off of here without breaking it? Where do you start? There's no obvious place to press or tug or pull or finesse in some way, Fortunately, I found on the instruction sheet for this radio, it said to, quote, insert finger in opening for B battery and gently apply pressure to the front cover from inside until it releases, but don't force it. That's what it says. Don't force it. Okay, so you go through that side battery cover. And speaking of things fragile, this whole radio is fragile. Most examples I've seen of this radio have cracks and chips on them. On the front, of course, and also by the battery covers. I don't think this plastic cabinet is any match for the radio that's inside of it. By that I mean the chassis inside here is really heavy, and if this radio is dropped, even a very minor drop, it's not going to go well. The chassis is going to take gravity's side, not the cabinets in that sort of an argument, with the weight of that chassis contributing to far more damage than this plastic cabinet could ever handle. You can see a couple of the little flat sub-miniature tubes in here. There are four altogether powering this radio, and the tubes here are branded Emerson. And speaking of power, this radio has two battery covers because it takes two different batteries. Those unfamiliar with tube technology in the pre-transistor era may be interested to learn that the tubes themselves needed their own power source just to light them up, like the tiny, dim light bulbs that they kind of are. Anyway, that power supply for the tube filaments is separate from the main power supply that makes all the rest of the radio work. In this radio, the filaments are lit by a 1.5 volt battery, which loads through the bottom battery cover. And the rest of the power is supplied by a long 45 volt battery that loads through the side. Here's what that long battery looks like. That Emerson branded one is exactly the battery specified in the instructions for this radio, the Emerson EM86 battery. The instructions say that that long battery will last five to seven times longer than the other one. That's good because it looks expensive. In tube type radios, batteries that light the tubes are known as A batteries, and the ones that do all the rest are B batteries. The A battery in this one, for lighting the filaments, is a standard C-cell battery. 
The instructions say you'll only get about four hours of radio play out of that battery. Lasting five to seven times longer than the A battery, that long B battery should last for about 25 hours of radio play. And here's a nice bonus you don't usually get with a collectible radio, the original receipt. It's dated September 30, 1953, and it's from Bates Radio and Television, not too far from USC in South Los Angeles. The customer paid $40 for it, plus tax, and he got the case and batteries thrown in with the deal. Well, that seems like quite a bargain, until you toss that figure into an inflation calculator and see that that's over $400 today. Still, well worth it, I am sure. And it's lasted this long. And here's Emerson's ad that appeared in several national magazines and might well have motivated the sale of this very radio. I can see how it would. There's one more thing to look at here, and it's good. Handed out by Emerson dealers to prospective buyers, this is the original sales flyer. A nifty little folder printed in the exact shape and size of the radio. On the inside, it says, Smaller than a miniature camera. New Emerson Pocket Radio, world's smallest personal portable. A miracle of precision engineering. It shows the radio in the clamshell box and says it's a thrilling gift. I'm going to read what it says on the back, where it also shows the measurements, six inches across and three and a half inches tall. As personal as your handwriting, as convenient as your fountain pen. That's the new Emerson Pocket Radio. Plays everywhere. A miracle of precision engineering. Just try this folder for size. So small, it tucks into a small purse. So small, fits a man's breast pocket. Come in, see and hear the Emerson Pocket Radio. You will marvel at its crystal clear tone, its big set power that can be heard in a crowd or across a large room. Personally yours, Emerson. Personally yours.